Hi, I'm Greg. Um, I talk about CVEs, kernel CVE stuff. Um, first off, this is all just me, my opinion. Nothing reflects the opinion of anybody else. Um, a lot of people disagree with me, but we all work together on the same thing. Um, many years ago, I gave a talk at Kernel Recipes in France about how CVEs don't mean anything. Um, how the system was broken, how things worked. It, it lived a long time. But things change. <laughs> CVs now mean something. <laughs> um, CVE.org announced that the kernel is a CNA, and there's a post about it, and there's some documentation. So now a CNA means a central naming, numbering authority. Kernel.org is responsible for any CVE that deals with a Linux kernel. Um, we did this because previously anybody could assign a CVE against a kernel and never tell us about it. And they did that <laughs> a lot. Um, one company, Red Hat, I'll say it, who they publicly admit this, would use it as a way to grease their engineering process to get a patch into the kernel for their, for their product, which is fine. It was working well for them. Um, but that was not reflecting on like bugs that were actually in the kernel for us, not just their enterprise kernel. Now, the community is in control. We are responsible for it all. And because we're responsible, we have to follow the rules of being a CNA. And those rules are actually pretty strict, but it's good. So we have to now assign a CVE for anything that's considered a vulnerability. There's a very specific definition. I'll talk about that in a minute. But we are required to publicly document all of this. That's our requirement. Not that we don't, we don't really want to, but in order to be a CNA and be responsible for this, we have to document everything. So here's a short summary of it all. How to contact us. We have a public uh, alias. Um, there's three of us that are currently working on this. Me, Sasha Levin, and Lee Jones. Um, there's some other people that help us at a part time as well. Um, and we do this on basis of our individual membership of the kernel community. We do not do this as a basis of uh, any employer. We are independent as part of the kernel.org community. And that's important. We're not assigned doing this work on behalf of an employer. Um, we have the documentation on how this all works. We have a public Git repo where you can see our reviews, our potential discussion of what we are classifying is going to be a CVE and what isn't going to be a CVE. And we have a public mailing list, and it's a public archive of everything that we have assigned a CVE to and what we've rejected as being a CVE. Because sometimes we assign them, and it turns out it wasn't good. It didn't actually. It wasn't a vulnerability. This is all, these are all requirements of the CNA of, from CV.org. So this is where everybody can find all this stuff. We do everything, most importantly, we do everything in public. You can see what we are considering to be a CVE ahead of time before we assign them. It's good. We're working in public. So let's talk about vulnerabilities. This is the official definition from CVE.org of what is and what is not a vulnerability. It's kind of basic. Um, to translate this to the kernel, what does this mean? It means this. We're at the level of the software stack we are, we're kind of middleware we, between the hardware and the rest of the world, um, any bug at our level can be a, almost be a vulnerability. Anything the user can trigger, any crash, reboot, memory use after free, very big issue right now, any leaks, any overflows, even a one byte overflow has been turned into a vulnerability. Incorrect boundary checks on things, denial of service, logic errors, lots and lots of little things. Um, what is not on there, I don't know if I mentioned this, um, oh, I'll talk about it a little bit. And then why is there so many? We have an option called panic on warn. Some sites of systems want to reboot the system if a warning is ever hit. If panic on warn is enabled and a user can actually trigger a kernel warning, which they can in a lot of situations, that's a vulnerability because it's denial of service machine reboots. Um, if that option wasn't there, I'd say about half of the things we're documenting as vulnerabilities and CVEs are not really CVEs. Um, this is real. A couple billion Android devices ship with panic on warn. All the cloud systems in the world run with panic on warn because they're used to rebooting and wanting to do it. It's a valid, it's a valid option. Um, I've oh, thankfully, hopefully convinced the big Android user to not have panic on warn be enabled. Um, so then that takes away a whole set of vulnerabilities for them. Um, but that's slow going. We'll see how that goes. So any warning in the kernel will reboot the system. 
again, that gets a CVE. What's not? What is not? Oh, and please ask questions as we go, if you have any questions. Um, these are not vulnerabilities, according to CVE. This does not get a CVE assigned. So if you rewrite all the data on your disk, that's not a CVE. If we crash, if we, if we crash at that time, yes, it is a CVE. But if we just overwrite your data, not a CVE. If we overwrite your process memory, we are, but storage, no. Um, bug fixes that are not externally triggered, that nobody can trigger outside the kernel. Inside the kernel, if we got some logic errors wrong, but nobody can actually get to it on a CVE. And performance issues. We can crawl, you can cause the system to go to an almost crawl, but it's not a denial service because it's still kind of working, not a CVE. Um, so be very aware of that. We're not assigning things for, like those top two things, a lot of people report issues to us. I'm like, we can't assign a CVE to them. Uh, that first one bothers me a lot. Um, because that means that if anybody's trying to cherry pick CVEs to backports and stuff like that, they'll miss real data corruption or loss, bug fixes. So CVEs are not the only thing you should be paying attention to in the kernel. So, complaints, issues, come on. All right. Um, when we assign a CVE, we're assigning them after the fact. And this is important. So. We assign them, usually on a one to two week delay, because it takes us a while to review these. Um, we're reviewing every single stable commit that lands in the tree, and um, anything that people send to us, but every single stable commit we review, and we judge on the definition of vulnerability. We have three of us doing this work, actually four, and maybe a fifth at times, but the three of us do this for every single one, and we review them in different ways. I review them with one way, reading them through email, put them in an email client. Um, another person uses some fun language modeling tools and runs them through his systems and get, spits out what he thinks match. And the third person has a really, really awesome regular expression and he runs that through there and does some other manual review. So it's three people reviewing in independent ways, which is very important. And then we look at best two, if we have two matches, we take that, if we have odd ones out, we'll talk about them, we'll put comments in the, in the commits that we have in the public thing, we'll chat with them every once in a while through email, and we come to agreement on what is and what isn't a, a CVE. Um, they only reflect the specific commit in the tree. And so if you had four patches that led up to the fix, if you look in the stable tree, we have a lot of stable depends on patches that are accepted. Stable, you'll we'll only give a CVE for the last one because that's where the actual fix happened. So you'll miss the fact if you want to cherry pick all those other fixes along the way. That's very important. And they're not tested independently. So we only test kernel, stable kernels as a bundle. So maybe 100, 150, 300 patches at a time. If you try and cherry pick them out, like just the CVE fixes, they might not work because we might not have noticed it. another change earlier made it easier or another change earlier was required to make this fix work. We test them as a whole. That's also very important. So again, and by the fact that we're doing a delay, this allows the world systems to be secure. If you take all the stable updates and update the things, you'll find that your system has all the CVE fixes already automatically. They're all there. Very, very rarely will we ever assign a CVE to an unfixed issue. We will if we have to, and it's assigned, we're notified, we're required, but it's very rare. And we will very rarely assign a CVE to a fix that is not in a stable kernel yet. It had happened this week that a fix landed in Linus's tree and hasn't been in a stable tree yet. We did assign a CVE based on the requester, but that's gonna be fixed as of tomorrow morning. <laughs> so um, it's kind of rare, but normally one to two weeks out of delay. And here's the normal development tree like when we use the 6.10, then it starts doing RC releases. Developers are at that point in time in the release cycle. We actually down 6.10.6, but the CV review is three or four back, just because it takes us some time to get here. Um, depending on travel, like uh, during the summer with all the conferences, we got like three or four weeks behind. We're caught up now. Um, so I, I punched out a bunch of CVEs this morning during the keynotes. Um, yeah, so as long as you stay on the tip, it's a lot better. Another, another restriction here is we do not assign hardware CVEs. So Spectra, Meltdown, hardware bugs in CPUs, hardware bugs in keyboard controllers, hardware bugs in other devices, we are not responsible for that. In fact, we're not allowed to assign CVEs. So that's a big issue. So if you think you're picking all the CVE fixes for all the hardware bugs just by looking at our feed, it's not there. Um, as an example, this AMD had a CVE for 
that was released last week for a hardware bug in their processor. We took the kernel patches, but I couldn't assign a kernel CVE for it, so it didn't go through our system. Hopefully, AMD announced it publicly and pointed at the right fixes, but I have no control over that. Um, it is a hole in the system because that's the way things work. So be very aware of that. Um, and as that, here's my good luck figuring that out. If you guys have ever tried to read the Intel or AMD patches or announcements to figure out how to match that up to a kernel patch is very, very difficult. Okay. Um, all right, here, I talked about this a little bit already. Um, we do different methods. Um, we do have a fourth person who has been sending us reviews, and we do take that fourth person's reviews as a check. Um, he's been helping us a lot. Um, they don't want to be identified. They just want to try and help us out. And we're using them as a check, like, uh, why did he pick this instead of us? And we talk about it and things like that. Because these are all there's gray areas. These are tricky things to figure out. But again, the cool thing is, Everybody can see this. It's in public in our Git repos. You can run the tools that we run. You can run them the different ways that we do it. Uh, you can see in advance by a couple weeks so what we're considering. We put notes in there saying, hey, this is why I said yes. This is why I said no. We need to get better at doing some of those. Um, but they're there. We do talk about that. Um, and you'll see what we rejected as well. We don't usually say why we rejected because it's like we just assume, but we discuss this at times. Again, in public, which is good. We're trying to be open about this. Um, developers ask us for them all the time. We'll give them a sign of CVE. I will usually ask, hey, can you wait till this hits a public release? Sometimes they say no, it's fine. Um, sometimes they say yes, they'll wait a week. Um, a lot of people like CVEs for their CV. I don't have any problem giving them out. You do the work, I'll give them to you. Uh, a bunch of interns, I think, um, through Shua's program or some program this, this summer got a bunch of CVEs. <laughs> so, sign, they're happy about it. <laughs> So it, it works out well. I know a number of college students ended up with that, and they're like, this is great. We can put on a resume. So, uh, corporate requests. I know companies come assign us, ask us things. The distros ask us, hey, can you assign us CV for this issue? Or this, and especially they'll go back in time. Uh, new distros can't assign things for anything. Uh, we can assign for past fixes as well, if people want them. Uh, I will call out Red Hat and Sousa, who want them for their old enterprise kernels. Great, I'll gladly assign them. Um, this works out really well. Actually, the developers of these companies are happy because it takes them to send an email. I say, great, it works. Here's your CVE, it goes through the system. We have it scripted um, on our end to push things out to the world in a JSON format. It's machine readable. Um, Debian consumes these machine readable formats really well so they can do their, their tests and to see what is and isn't fixed in each release. Works out pretty well. So, any questions on how we assign them, how we pick them, how we do this stuff? John? Or I can repeat the question, too. So, you say you cannot assign CVEs for hardware bugs. Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish between a hardware bug and a driver bug that simply does not drive the hardware correctly? Because one might say that addressing a hardware bug is how you drive the hardware correctly. When the hardware bug crosses operating system issues. So when the hardware company is responsible for driving the fix um, for CPU, and like it also affects Windows, or it also affects OS X, that's the definition of it's the hardware's responsibility for that. When it's a bug in our driver, um, it's our, our issue. Now, I have not, if we all got the bug in the driver wrong, because the hardware is not at fault, but the driver is at fault, it's our fault. If we're put, pasting over an issue that's a bug in the hardware, it's the hardware's fault. It's a gray area. Normally, we're, we've been doing this for CPUs. Um, I don't think we've had any network controller people um, complain about this because they don't like assigning CVs in the first place. <laughs> and we have, we have a lot of network driver bugs assigned as CVEs, and nobody's ever pushed back and said, we want to take over this instead. But the hardware vendors, I'll call it AMD, Intel, um, they want to. That's their own. They own those. And that's fine. So anything that goes through the hardware um, security process, all those issues, like we have a whole re review and secure mailing list and discussion and work, and Linus and I hate it, and we're trying to get rid of that, um, and Thomas hates it too. Um, those are not our CVEs. We can't assign those. I wish. I don't know. Uh, my question would be maybe 
is there any way uh, the maintainer can help in this process? So not looking at the CV, if for example there is uh, any fix which needs to be backported, we can for example CC the stable uh, mailing list and this like, will show you that, hey, please this has to be ported to stable. So similarly, will, be, will be, there be a way, if there is a patch and I think it's a CVE, as a maintainer, will uh, there be any way to put a hint or put a tag or I don't know, put a CC uh, CVE with you uh, ah, that's okay. No, that's a great idea. Um, we haven't had anybody ask us for that. So far, maintainers who fix security bug fixes usually just email us and say, can you please assign a CV for this good ID? We're like, yeah. Just, yeah, it's just after the fact, though. Or yeah. actually, some people do it ahead of the fact. I do reserve CVEs for fixes that are not published yet or patches that haven't landed in Linus's tree, I can reserve them and not announce them until after they're public. Mm. And I do that. So, but to do it automatic, Tagging. Um. Uh, it's just you know to avoid to miss the reg or something like that. Uh, there is a priority that things get out of the cut in the uh, full yeah, of the yeah, cracks. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. if it's standardized, like you think it's a CV, do this, then you know for sure that uh, it goes I, to you. We have a hard enough time getting people to tag patches for stable. Uh, <laughs> I try to. No, I'm just saying there are whole <laughs> subsystems out there who I regularly harass for not tagging things properly for stable. So trying to get them to do it for CVEs. Let's not make it automatic yet. Um, these aren't a lot. These are not a huge quantity. So hopefully we don't have to automate that. But um, you can always email you email us. Um, a lot of times people email us after they've sent the patch to the mailing list. And they say, hey, go. can you assign this when it hits Linus's tree? And then you'll watch. We can reserve. We just based on the message ID. And we add it to our database and check it in. And away it goes. So we can do it after we're back. It's not that hard. Any questions? Um, how fast are we going? Um, we're doing about 55 a week. <laughs> um, that seems like a lot, right? Um, but we are not number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, the kernel is unique, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but um, the number, the quantity of CVs are, have increased. And this isn't just for the kernel. It isn't just for the, that. It's over the whole, whole world. And Kurt and Josh have been around the security community for a very long time. Wrote this a while ago. It's a great, great article. All the CVs in the world have increased because people are paying more attention to it. People are buying into this more. But maybe also they're tracking things they shouldn't be tracking. And maybe the definition of CVE isn't right. And that's a meta comment. And I don't necessarily agree with everything the CVE is or does, but I have to play by those rules. But um, maybe we need to rethink how security fixes are identified and tracked and whatnot. Because this quantity, this feed that's been hit the world is huge. Again, we're not number one by any means. We're about the same. Um, the cool thing about what the kernel does, it's a little bit more unique, is we're, these CVEs I'm giving you are very, very, very descriptive. Um, I'm giving you as much information as I possibly can. I'm telling you what files are affected. I'm telling you when it showed up. I'm telling you what branches it was fixed in, what git commit ID it was fixed in. And because of that, it turns out very, very few CVs actually are relevant for you. Because you don't build every, what, 40 million? How many, 40,000? How many lines, how many different files do we have? We got 40 million lines now, 38 million? Uh, something. We have a lot of lines of code. Um, but the thing is, like, my laptop's only running 2 million, but my phone is running 4.5 million. Your server is running maybe 1 million. Servers are simple, um, except for that network card out there. Um, a lot of them are not really applicable for you. In fact, most of them are not. Oh, and all this is in machine readable format. Um, there's a public Git repo. You can get our JSON files out of there. Um, Case Cook is starting to do some uh, review of the JSON today and found some, there's some, really weird areas of it. But there's also another format, we've an intermediate format between the JSON and the raw Git files that we have that Debian uses that's very machine readable, much simpler than the JSON. Uh, if you want to use it, look at what's in there. We describe how it's documented well. And you can find them all. And you can find all the CVs in the world in another Git repo. GitHub, or CVE publishes that. So just the kernel ones are there, all the world's there. So the big thing about the kernel is not everybody uses the kernel in the same way. I mean, kernels in this, in the spaceships, it's on your laptop, it's in embedded cow milking machines, it's all different things. So everybody's use case is different. 
So my use case is different than your use case. So the same code, body of code, is going to be used in different ways and different security models and everything. So I can't determine severity. So I don't know what severity is for you. So as an organization, we do not dictate the CSS score. We do not dictate the severity of it all. We just say, this is a vulnerability that is fixed. It's up to you to determine whether it's applicable to you or not. Now, that's hard for some people. And there's some groups. There was a big um, boff at the plumbers conference about this, where different use cases are trying to get together and try and review these, and like the cloud use case, the enterprise distro use case, maybe the embedded use case. And they're going to try and classify CVEs based on that. Um, I wish them luck. I think it's easier just to take all the fixes, but that's what they want to do. And if they want to work on that, they're going to do that. So you only know what's going on. Um, some CVs are for you. <laughs> um, and ignoring them is at your jeopardy. So again, we fix, we fix real security issues every single week in public. And sometimes not in public. We fix real security issues every week. Um, the only, only, only way you can stay secure is if, again, if you take everything. Um, take all the stable. Take, these are tested together. The community is giving this to you for free. And as for free, the community is also saying, here's all the fixes that are for, done. So take this free resource and use it. To not take the free resource is very, very, very odd. And the bonus is you get all the data corruption fixes. There's, a, again, a ton of data corruption fixes in file systems that are getting fixed all the time. Please take them. <laughs> um, my lovely, lovely quote that I've been saying for over a decade. Um, I'll stick to it. I have not been proven wrong yet. Um, systems insecure. Um, Case said this really good quote a while ago. Um, you have two choices. You can pick the latest tables and let everything and get your system so you can always update the latest tables all the time. Or you can try and cherry pick things and only fix the ones that you think are applied. Um, both of those are big amounts of work. One of them, you only have to do the work one time, and then it pays off for forever. The second option, you have to do a lot of work all of the time. Um, pick your choice. You get one of those two choices. Um, there is not another path to running a kernel with the flaws fixed other than those two choices. Personally, I pick the first choice, do the work up front. You can reboot the world all the time and move on. Android's done this choice. They've put the testing infrastructure together and done it. I've talked to a bunch and worked with a bunch of cloud providers recently. They're working on that. Sometimes there are physical limitations. Somebody said, when we reboot our data center, the power goes out. OK. <laughs> they will fix that. And they'll stagger it across the data center. And they found that out the hard way. <laughs> um, but that was like, oh, that's on us. That's our hardware issue. So they'll work through it. Because rebooting all the time matters. And a lot of people are really happy with this fact that we're calling these things out. So again, your two options, triage all 55 a week. It's a lot to work. It's a lot to do. Or fix them. Um, I'd say the last one. The fun thing is, so I took an example. I looked at a kernel version and the CVEs that were assigned to it. So here's the latest Android kernel at the time. I did this about a month and a half ago. Um, that release, there was 94 commits in that release. 19 of them were marked as CVEs. It's not bad. Um, but Android is cool. When you check, when they do the merge is in, it, it actually identifies what patches apply to the code that they built. Because you know your kernel configuration. You can see that. So there's a very simple intersection. And out of that, um, there was four commits that actually had a CV assigned. And 19, there's actually 19 commits out of that, how many of those, 94, were actually affected their build. So here, if you want to review 19 commits a week, maybe that's a good thing for you. And you can do that. Four of them were CVEs. The fun thing is I looked at this. Um, that week, OSX for Apple had 10 CVEs assigned to it. And Windows had 15. <laughs> um, so that was a lucky week for us. Other weeks have been 10 for the kernel. But um, we're running at the same rate of change of CVEs as the other software products out there. So the kernel is not this huge number that people see, this 55 a week. Um, it's not out of step with all the other software projects in the world. It's good. We're fixing these. And that's also good for them, because I was worried that if they weren't reporting all these bugs, then they're not actually doing any work on them. OS X, Windows is doing work. They're fixing their bugs. They're just use cases defined, and it's tinier. They're tinier code bases. That. So they're ready to change for CVs. It's pretty much what we are. Um, it's be fun. I think Case is going to track some numbers and see how things go from there, which is good.
So again, here's the Android example. There's the four CVEs, and there's the diff stat of the CVEs. So reading six files, 18 lines in, added, five lines deleted, was very trivial to do so. Um, it's not that hard if you want to do pick and choose and cherry pick. I don't recommend it, but it isn't an un fathomable thing. Now, for an enterprise distro, that might be a lot harder because you're building the world. You might have to look at them all. But for some embedded systems, if you want to do this, it's not that tough. So, questions? Examples? Yes. Um, is there any way that we can also get the information on the reproducer for the CV? And there's no such there's no such requirement to have a reproducer for a CVE. All right, but could we get one? Because usually <laughs> on the fixed series there will be some, there might be some self test that could reproduce the issue, and it's like kind of a nice info. I totally agree. That would be nice to have that. Um, there's no requirement for reproducing. Um, if you look at us, our CVEs, our CVE data that's in the in the body of the CVE description is our change log data. And a lot of times in that change log data, it says, this is a problem because of this. So like, if memory was allocated and failed, we'll pass a null pointer back and dereference a null pointer. OK. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to create a system that's going to fail a memory allocation. But you can extrapolate from there. There's frameworks for doing that and things like that. Um, just go off what's in the change log. That's where you read the change log and the patches in order to uh, assign the CVEs. Um, we don't have reproducers. It's not a requirement. There's no such requirement. Um, sometimes those might be theoretical and impossible to hit in the real world. I don't know, <laughs> but I still signed it. And so because of that, um, a lot of times people do review this. I'll call it SUSE is doing a really good job of reviewing them and say, hey, this really isn't an issue. You can't hit this. You can't hit this because of this. We'll go, yep, you're right, and we'll reject it. And that's a really powerful thing. Now we can actually reject CVEs very easily. Before, it was almost impossible to get a kernel CVE rejected. Um, and they'd linger on for forever and whatnot. I can reject it instantly, and away we go. So, sorry about that. There's no, re no reproducers. Yeah. <laughs> so one more comment. Uh, so I actually sent a few of the email. I'm, I'm from SUSE. <laughs> so, so one of the... Um, one of the things I try to help is that for some of the CV does not have a specific um, hash commit on what what hash commit introduced the yes. the bug. That's a very and, good issue. Problem. Yeah, and, you're doing a very good job of pointing out where they actually were showing yeah, up. Thank you. <laughs> and, and sometimes I don't have the time to dissect like completely to know 100% what issue, when the issue is introduced. So the best I have is something like maybe version 5.5, like 60% sure. So like any, I don't know, any, any suggestion on how, like, because I know the, usually you need a hash commit to put it in your, uh, your phone or phone .kit. So like, any comment on that? Like, so default to safe and accept the commit. Okay. <laughs> so I, this one. Or send me an ID. So like uh, you've sent them and said, oh, this is really where this issue showed up. Because a lot of people don't, times we don't have fixes tags. And we'll add it to our repo and update the JSON and update the mailbox and then away it goes. Um, I don't have the time to review those 100, 300 or 55 a week to determine all this one. We just don't have that resources. By default to make it safe, just take it. What's, what's, what's wrong with taking a patch that the kernel community has already deemed acceptable? <laughs> no, it's not a problem, but <laughs> I think it would, be, it would be nice to also share that information. Oh, so if you send case. me that information, I add it to the repo. And there's also a references tag. We can reference, I reference Project Zero Bob posts in the JSON all the time. We can add this metadata to the JSON file. It's all there. So if you know the information, send it to me, and I can put it in there, and we'll update the JSON to properly show it for the world. All right, but the problem is that I don't have the specific hash commit. Uh, so uh, I agree. But we need something, right? right? You can guess. I don't want to take something you guess. But okay. 5.5 is a git commit ID. <laughs> so if you look, um, we take prot time 0 as our first git commit ID. Um, people have objected that say sometimes things showed up before that. And I'm like, well, cve.org wants our first git commit ID ever to be time 0. 
we look at that as forever. And I think anybody who's spelunking beyond that is either doing it for research, like Case is doing, you should never be running kernels that old. <laughs> so, well, but yeah. All right, thank you. Cool. All right, I'm gonna go on, I'm running out of time. Um, we have tools. Here's a cool tool. Um, Dyad is the thing that we'll, I talked about that makes an intermediate form. It's colon separated with the commit and the version number of when something was introduced and when on the stable releases in the kernel tree, it was actually fixed. Figuring out this information is hard. <laughs> it's non-trivial. Um, so here's a tool that everybody can use. Please use it. Some horrible bash code um, because <laughs> our commits are a mess. Um, the number of exceptions and the exception handling we've had to write into our tool is amazing. I found some new ones the other day, too. Um, here's some examples. The best is we had fixes that went forward in time. It says, I fixed, this commit fixes this ID that ended up being merged to the tree before the fix did. <laughs> um, that was, oh, fixes going backwards, yeah, and some other fun stuff. Um, we have vulnerabilities only in branches. Um, that one actually messes with the CVE's JSON format a little bit. Um, it doesn't like it. Um, CVE doesn't know how to really handle that very well. Um, we do represent it, and you can see it. it makes things a little messier at times. Um, no fixes. Sometimes we say we fix things and it really wasn't a fix. Um, anyway, these are some of our history. Uh, it's, I mean, human entered information. It's messy. Uh, we have a tool that will create a CVE record for a specific git commit. It uses Dyad to actually create the things. Um, there's all the options for it. You want to create your own JSON for it. Um, people actually send me some fixes. Great, there's some fix me's in there. Please send me some fixes. We're not good bash programmers, but it's there. Um, people have complained and wanted it in Python. I said I'd take patches. Um, my Python knowledge is not very good. Um, and then we have a fun tool called Struck. Um, anybody Dutch in here? Oh, okay. I'm not going to explain what Strach means. Um, it shows how vulnerable you are. You give it a, any git commit ID in the tree, and it'll show you all the outstanding CVEs, IDs that are not fixed as of that point in time. Those do change because we do things, new things come up all over the time. So there's this moment in time versus this database of time. And we'll also see, given a version number of a release, what was actually fixed in there. And the first one takes a little while to chew over the database. The second one, it goes pretty fast. And this is a big long list. Um, this is helpful for some people writing some change logs. I know I think Debian uses this. Um, it's actually really helpful to look at any specific Android release, because you know the root of where that was. You can run it and see what is and isn't vulnerable at that point in time. Um, it's really good to see what fixes have not been backported to active branches. People do that. Um, I'll call it Wind River. It's doing a lot of good work. Oracle doing a lot of good work. Backporting fixes for branches, stable branches that we care about that are vulnerable and not fixes aren't there yet because they didn't apply properly or it is some rework. So all these tools are open and please do that. Um, yeah, I will quote Case again. It's a good thing to end on. Um, any questions, comments, heckles? This, you guys are easy. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, that's the way things work. Um, the fun thing about CVE, and I'll call out Europe and other countries, um, CVE is a US government-sponsored organization. The CRA, which is a European law that's coming into effect, it is in effect, it's gonna be implemented in a couple of years. We'll call out another database that people need to work with. They cannot work with CVE because that's a US government-sponsored agency or entity which CVE knows about, so they're trying to figure out how to do this. So we will soon, the kernel tools are set up, they can, we can feed anything. So I'm working with the EU groups to be able to feed these into the EU identifiers and get identifiers from that. China right now actually copies the CVE database and adds some metadata to it and adds some additional ones. So as long as they enter into CVE, I'm okay in China. Uh, Japan, I think, is gonna be implementing their own thing as well. Um, I can work with them and send them whatever feed they want. Um, Give me a JSON endpoint and I can feed stuff to it. It'll work. Um, so that'll handle the fact that different agencies and different countries are handling these in unique ways. Ideally, cve.org would become independent. Um, I know they're looking into it. I don't know how that's on them to fix that. They know it's a problem. 
Bien sûr. So the tools we have for generating the CVEs and the struct tool you, you mentioned, uh, would it make sense to, for those to go into kernel repo or would you rather keep them? Separate? They're in our vulnerability re repo. Um, because they, when I modify those and update them, then they, I rerun and update all the JSON and the whole tree and push it out again. So right now, like me and Lee and Sasha just iterate over them because they're independent for us. But all the, we're, not, we're using the metadata from a kernel repo based on the change log, but it's independent. Okay. So the reason to keep them separate is... Uh... It's, yeah. I mean, I, we can add them to there, but it's just that I'd have to... Chuck it into two places. It's fine. It, it runs off the database. It runs off of is another database that I ran where I abused the, the file system as a database for all Git commits. But it actually works really fast. It says Linux file system is really fast. That's how we look up what commit ID is fixed and backported and at what places. So we have tools to do that. If, if there's a readme on how to set everything up, where to download things, if you want to run these yourself. Maybe if they stabilize, we'll check them in. They're kind of tied. The, the thing is, they need the repo, the vulnerability repo themselves to run against. Because <laughs> so, it's querying the data that's in the JSON. <laughs> guys are easy. Nothing else? Cool. Well, thank you very much.